Hello everyone, good morning. I know there are some people still getting to their seats. Um, and you can take your time in the back. You can look over what we have there, especially I know the sandwiches are of particular interest. So you can go ahead and take your time back there. But I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for coming today to our first women's leadership lecture of this year. We are so honored and grateful to have Dr. Janice Johnson with us. Before we get started, we'll have an opening prayer by Riley Gruel from San Antonio, Texas, who is studying finance. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here today together and to um, learn from Dr. Johnson. We're grateful for this food and we ask thee that we can have open hearts and that we can feel the spirit and that we can learn things that will be valuable to us and that we can <laughs> apply them to our lives. And we love thee and we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so to get started, I'll and you introduce you to Dr. Johnson. So, Janice Johnson grew up in California and graduated from Brigham Young University after serving as a missionary in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She has a master's degree in American Religious History and Theology from BYU and Vanderbilt, respectively, and a doctorate from the University of Leicester? Leicester. <laughs> Wowie, okay. University of Leicester in England. Oh, well, that must have been so cool. Um, she is the general editor of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, Complete Legal Papers, University of Oklahoma Press, and co-author of The Witness of Women, Deseret Book. She is currently the Laura F. Wiles Faculty Research Associate at the Maxwell Institute at BYU. If you could join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson, that would be much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Thanks, Bailey. Um, and thanks, thanks for coming. There's still a front row if you people want seats. I promise I won't, I'll try to not spit. Um, so I never planned to go to divinity school. Um, going, growing up as a Latter-day Saint in California and then attending BYU, I didn't have an idea of what divinity school was. I wasn't going to be ordained as a minister. Why should a Latter-day Saint girl do such a thing? And really, to be historic, I was a Mormon girl at that point. Um, but despite the unknown, there I was, driving to Nashville, ready to begin divinity school at Vanderbilt University. This was one of the many critical times in my life that I've had to rely on the spirit and step, sometimes leap, into the darkness. I didn't know anyone who had gone to divinity school. I had no role model to direct me. I needed the spirit to show me that this was my path. Elder Neil A. Maxwell repeatedly taught that the Holy Ghost will often preach sermons to us from the pulpit of memory. I heard him say this at a regional conference at BYU and it struck me. Sometime later, a little known professor suggested that Vanderbilt might be a good place for me. Over time, that thought kept coming back to me. I decided there was purpose in that memory and followed the glimmer of inspiration. It led me to Nashville to Divinity School. Now, when I thought about my plan for my life, Divinity School wasn't even on my radar. Um, my plan was always to go to law school. Well, almost always. I think there was a brief time where I was a communications major just because I had to put something down when I started <laughs> at BYU. Um, this thing that wasn't even on my radar enough to even be an option became a critical part of me being prepared to fulfill my own mission. Each of us has a unique mission to perform. Maybe you will tread a pa similar path to your mother and your grandmother. Maybe you'll follow a path on a completely different part of the map, or maybe you will have to bushwhack your own path through the dense jungle in previously uncharted territory. As you learn to hear the voice of the Lord, you will be able to find your own individual path. Consider the Lord's counsel to a group of missionaries in 1831, not to build upon another's foundation, neither journey in another's track. It is your responsibility to find your own track. You were called and prepared from the foundation of the world to fulfill your own unique mission, your own holy calling. 
Now, as I decided, oh, it would help if I turned this on. It's more useful that way. Um, as I decided to attend Divinity School, I felt confident in my decision, yet I still had worries. I had worries about logistics, packing up all of my stuff, moving across the country, and keeping my soul together. I worried that I was leaving my friends in my comfort zone. I worried that all my Latter-day Saint marriage possibilities were being left behind in Utah. I also had a vague worry that academic notions of religion might be harmful to my testimony. Despite these concerns, I very clearly felt that I was supposed to go to Vanderbilt. Ever the planner, I strategized that I would listen to conference talks on my way to and from school each day as an antidote to whatever spirit-crushing things I had learned that day. Um, my, my initial worries weren't unfounded. The move took work. It took work to make new friends. School was the kind of work that was never done. And, but clearly I like that. A glutton for punishment because I continue doing that. But scholarships didn't cover all my expenses and dateable Latter-day Saint men were short in short supply in Nashville. In the midst of some dating angst the following summer, an important moment came when a BYU professor, Bonnie Bailiff Spanville, counseled me that she knew I was trying to follow the Spirit, and if I was supposed to be married, I would get married. She urged me not to expend so much energy worrying about it. <laughs> If I followed the spirit, I would be where and with whom I needed to be. Though I can't say my application of her advice has been perfect, her words stayed with me. Um, likewise, my worries about religion and the academy had a real foundation. Uh, religion and the academy can maintain an uncomfortable coexistence, but the tension can also be productive. I had been well prepared by religion classes that were both spiritual and academic at BYU, and I had already begun to consider difficult questions of the gospel and scriptural text. Some things came easier than others. My first semester I took classes in early Christianity, Hebrew Bible, and American religious history. When my early Christianity professor showed us archaeological photographs of ancient baptismal fonts not used for the living, I told my friends that Latter-day Saints knew just what to do with those. I marveled at differences among Christians, the way in which we define authority and interpret scripture. I told my friend, um, oh, I also recognize that all religious people are not on the right side of the political aisle. When some of my evangelical friends struggled with facing the historical reality of man-made scripture that took hundreds of years to come together as biblical canon, the Book of Mormon had already taught me that any text will be limited by the mistakes of men. I came to believe that the limitations of the scriptural text do not negate their spiritual value. They just complicate it. Joseph Smith taught that mortal language will always be limited, crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect. I think about this all the time. Despite that, the imperfect medium of language can be a conduit to revelatory transcendence when combined with the Spirit. I began to love the beauty of the Bible, sometimes even because of its human limitations. Now, during my second semester at Vanderbilt, I took a feminist theology class. As a student at BYU, I had read an article, BYU Studies article, Feminism in the Light of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And my response was pretty basic. Jesus was a feminist, and so was I. <laughs> um, as Mary Stovall Richards and Kent Harrison wrote, in its most basic form, feminism echoes eternal truths of the gospel, which affirm the equal worth of all people, the equal right to and capacity for spirituality, and the evils of abuse. I never understood those who saw feminism as a bad word. However, in my feminist theology class at Vanderbilt, I also learned that patriarchy was the great evil in the world. And there came the tension. I grew up in an egalitarian family in Ward in California. And until that point, I'd really only seen the good that came from patriarchal church structure. I had always been able to write off aberrations to the good as corrupt individuals. Individuals who were set upon the things of this world and aspired to the honors of men, who could no longer claim th lay claim on priesthood authority no matter their position. Within this structure, I had been loved, taken care of, and given opportunities to thrive. 
Now Vanderbilt, I read from cutting edge feminist theologians and saw many parallels to Latter-day Saint theology. Focusing on the feminine divine might have been radical for these contemporary Protestant and Catholic theologians, but Joseph Smith was a radical. Elements of the restored church have always been radical. I entered the class believing I had both a heavenly mother and a heavenly father. I could see the expansive potential of the restoration and the importance of women in fulfilling that vision. Equality was not something to dismiss because of contemporary political baggage. Equality was central to the law of consecration and central to the restored gospel. For the first time, I really began to contemplate why the Lord said, if you are not equal in earthly things, you cannot be equal in heavenly things. If we were to become equal in power, in might, and in dominion in the celestial kingdom, then equality among all had to be our goal here. I could not dismiss the good I had seen and experienced in the church, nor could I dismiss the difficulties that were opening up before my eyes as I began to more deeply consider the experience of others. Reading womanist and liberation theology has helped me con to consider the effect of otherness of my sisters and brothers in mortality. I recognize that not everyone has the privilege to brush off what I saw as aberrations. For some, that is all they experience. Joseph's revelations taught me that every soul was of infinite worth in the sight of God, and feminist theology reminded me that I needed to work so that all souls were valued and could thrive. If we were to value the souls of others, as does God, then we must take that first important step to listen to their voices. Now, my time at Vanderbilt pushed me and stretched me in ways that were not always comfortable. Yet I consistently gained more confidence in the beautiful and radical nature of the Restoration as I grew increasingly grateful for the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and perhaps most significantly, Revelation. And had I not followed those glimmers of inspiration when they initially came or let those worries overwhelm that inspiration, I would have missed out on a time that I consider to be of critical importance for my mission in mortality. Finding a path unlike the one I originally envisioned for myself requires the guidance of the Spirit. Negotiating a space between academic arguments and gospel truths requires the guidance of the Spirit. Finding a place as an academic single woman in a married church requires the guidance of the Spirit. Knowing when to speak up and when to shut my mouth requires the guidance of the Spirit. My dad's giggling up there. <laughs> Let's be honest, I really need that some days. Um, Relief Society President, uh, I'm a little behind, Relief Society President Julie Beck taught, the ability to qualify for, receive, and act on personal revelation is the single most important skill that can be acquired in this life. I believe she spoke a truth essential to mortality. Again and again, my own experience has underscored this. If I can confidently stand before God, I will be okay. But I must learn to hear God's voice. Let's read that quote again. The ability to qualify for, receive, and act on personal revelation is the single most important skill that can be acquired in this life. The single most important skill in mortality. Rarely can we speak in such exceptionalist terms and actually be right, I think. Um, receiving revelation is a skill. It's not learned in an instant. It takes time, practice, and patience for us to recognize how God speaks to us. Please forgive me as I wax autobiographical today, but my own experience is central to how I think about recognizing the Spirit. And I hope in so doing we can talk about the principles that apply to all of us whether or not divinity school is in your future. Now, growing up in the church, I felt like 98%, that is a very um, specific number, but 98% of the talks I ever heard on personal revelation quoted the exact same verses in Doctrine and Covenants. The Lord's words to Oliver Cowdery from April 1829, what we know as section nine. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind and then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore you shall feel that it is right. Perhaps we like section nine because it seems like an easy formula. 
Um, there is just one problem, and my problem is here, because I never felt something that I would describe as a burning in my bosom. Isn't burning uncomfortable? <laughs> I didn't know what to do with that. Moreover, the only other option of revelatory response in this model is a stupor of thought, an absence of an answer. And there were plenty of times when I'd felt a direct no from the Lord. My experience didn't match up what I thought was the pattern of personal revelation from Scripture. Now, I will take that off for those of you who are offended by that. But um, today, I, I think I can look at Section 9 in a little more balanced way, but I think it can be useful. Maybe your Rory Gilmore and pro and con lists are your thing, um, your favorite thing when you're trying to receive revelation, that you write down all the possibilities. But it should never be considered the only pattern to receive revelation. There is never just one way or one pattern through which God speaks to us. Elder Richard G. Scott instructed, there is no simple formula or technique that would immediately allow you to master the ability to be guided by the voice of the Spirit. Our heavenly parents expect us to learn how to obtain that divine help by exercising faith. We all want easy answers here, but this is not a skill that has come by easily. I know that can feel intimidating. If we ever feel frustrated, I, these are all Caitlin um, Connolly, who is a friend of mine, her paintings, but this, this is, can all be intimidating. If we ever feel frustrated that we can't hear God's voice, we should remember it isn't simple for anyone. No one snaps their fingers and immediately just gets it. We all have to learn the skill ourselves. As we're taught in the Lord's preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaks to me in my weakness, after my manner of language, so that I might come to understanding. We're all weak. For some of us, our weakness is readily apparent. For others of us, it is hidden deep below, away from the world. But for all of us, weakness is our mortal state. And God still wants to communicate with us in our weakness. As the Maxwell Institute's director, Spencer Fluman, recently reminded us, it is not only you looking for God, but God's seeking after you. God has been seeking after you. Let me read that again, because I messed it up. But God has been seeking after you. We can all learn to hear and feel his seeking after us. God will speak to us after our manner of language, whether that's our native tongue or in a style that only we can hear. As we continue to gain this skill, we learn the pattern that the Lord uses to communicate with us individually. No one else can perfectly tell me how this works, just like no one can perfectly tell you how this works. We each have to learn the way God communicates with us through our own experience. We each have to work to develop that skill. Do you know the pattern that God uses to communicate with you? Now, to think about how we develop that skill, I want us to consider the lives of some of the early saints. Um, currently, I am working on a book on early Book of Mormon reception. I'm working to better understand how the earliest converts to the Book of Mormon received the book, how they decided it was scripture, became converted to the book, and how they used it, how they developed a relationship with the book. Um, some of the earliest saints were introduced to the Book of Mormon by family and friends, others by missionaries, but they all had to decide what to do with it. As President Nelson reminds us, no matter our situation, conversion is a unique revelatory process for all of us. Conversion to the Book of Mormon is personal and individual. Revelation doesn't happen in the same way for any of us. Conversion is as unique as we are. Now, consider the two women on the two ends of this photograph. Um, Zina Huntington Young is on the left, and Eliza R. Snow is on the right. Dressed in similar dark dresses with fingerless lace gloves and comparably styled vintage hair, to our view, they look alike. On paper, their lives also almost look identical. They both joined the church early on, both crossed the plains to Utah, both were wives of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and both were General Relief Society presidents. 
If our comparison ended there, however, we would miss the power of their individual paths and personalities. As we look at how they gained a conviction of the Book of Mormon, we begin to see them as individuals, each valuable on her own, and are reminded that there is no one way to gain a testimony of the Book of Mormon, just as revelation never comes in the same way for everyone. Now, Zina, um, here we have Zina, and her full name is actually Zina Diantha Huntington Jacob Smith Young. So there's a bit there. Um, now, Zina first saw the Book of Mormon, she called it that strange new book, lying on the windowsill of the family sitting room when she was 14. Later, she said that as she picked it up, the sweet influence of the Holy Spirit accompanied it to such an extent that I pressed it to my bosom in a rapture of delight, murmuring as I did so, this is truth, truth, truth. She felt that it was true. A testimony came quickly for Zina, seemingly without any effort on her part. The Spirit witnessed truth to her before she had ever read a word. As a missionary, I wanted everybody to have this kind of experience, to know immediately, to like touch the book and they knew. In contrast, conviction about the Book of Mormon did not come so easily for Eliza R. Snow. Her mother and sister joined the church. Eliza met Joseph Smith and thought he had an honest face. She heard two of the three witnesses testify about the book, such impressive testimonies she had never heard before. Even so, she didn't want to move too quickly and be deceived. I can imagine the frustration of her mom and her sister as they tried to share the gospel with her. Um, but she was worried that it all might just be a flash in the pan. And it took her four years of studying scripture, ancient prophets familiar and new, before her heart was fixed and she decided to join the Church of Christ. Though she worried she had waited too long, once her heart was fixed, she remained dedicated to that conviction. In the 19th century Relief Society, Eliza was known as the head of the Relief Society, and Zina was the heart. Eliza was a poet and an intellectual, and Zina exuded compassion. Neither of these was the right way to be a Latter-day Saint. Eliza picked Zina as their counselor not because she was exactly like her, but perhaps because she was not. There was a place for both of them. The church needed both of them. Now, believing that the Book of Mormon was scripture never proceeded in exactly the same way. Not all reactions were initially positive. Smith family neighbor Ezra Thayer first heard of the Gold Bible in the fall of 1830. He'd known Joseph as a kid and didn't see how he could produce a divine book. The thought filled him with wrath. The hostility, however, melted away when he first touched a copy of the Book of Mormon given to him by Hiram in front of the Smith family home. Ezra wrote of the moment he opened the book, I received such a shock, a shock with such exquisite joy that no pen can write and no tongue can express. He bought the book for 14 shillings, Hiram might have overcharged him. And when he opened it again, he said he felt a double portion of the spirit. He was truly in heaven. He read the book and his testimony began to expand. Now for most, reading of the book was essential to gain a witness. When the elders shared the Book of Mormon with Sarah D. Armand P. and her family, Sarah was anxious to see the book for herself. Rather than spending the evening with the missionary visitors, Sarah asked to be excused so she could read. She spent most of the night reading the book and was greatly astonished at its contents. She detailed, it left an impression upon my mind not to be forgotten, for in fact the book appeared to be open before my eyes for weeks. At the outset, Sarah had no expectation of baptism, but her belief in the book blossomed and soon she wanted to become a saint. Now, comparably, John Murdoch felt an intense desire to know if it was true. An avid Bible reader, he had moved from church to church for years. And obtaining a copy of the Book of Mormon, he declined to attend a confirmation meeting, choosing rather to immediately delve into the book. He wanted to know. This night must prove it to be true or false. Reading the book confirmed truth to him. 
After his baptism, he shared the new book as he read with his friends and family. As a missionary, he preached of the book and encouraged others to read for themselves. The content of the Book of Mormon was critical to John's conversion, as well as his subsequent missionary service, and provided a significant pattern for his future life. Now, for many, the, an initial spiritual experience or the pull of a charismatic leader was not enough. Further study had to support the, an initial positive experience. They wanted to be confident. For numerous early converts, significant reading of the new text, along with their Bibles, helped them develop a relationship with the book and led to conversion. Um, Caroline Barnes Crosby met an elderly gentleman from Vermont who taught her of the Book of Mormon shortly after moving to Kirtland. Though she was soon convinced of the truth, she considered it best to read the Book of Mormon and search the Bible until she was thoroughly convinced that it was the work of the Lord. After studying the Bible and the Book of Mormon for several months, she was baptized as a member of the Church of Christ. Caroline would continue to learn from this new scripture. Her sister, Louisa Barnes Pratt, attempted to read the Book of Mormon more than once, but felt that she was, had been so immersed in worldly cares that she never progressed. Later, it was her reading of the Bible that actually confirmed to her the truth of the Book of Mormon. Then she developed a relationship with the Book of Mormon, too. Now, acceptance to this book could take in hours, place in hours or days, or for others it took months or years. There was no single, singular formula or timeline. Not long after publication, the early missionary Samuel Smith introduced the Book of Mormon to Methodist lay preacher Phineas Young. Using a pattern that Moroni lays out at the end of the book, Samuel asked Phineas, if you will read this book with a prayerful heart and ask God to give you a witness, you will know the truth of this work. Phineas did not need to rely on Samuel's words. He could go to God directly. This was my favorite part of being a missionary, is telling people, you didn't have to trust in me. Go to God. Ask God. None of us is left solely to rely on the witness of another. We too must ask God for ourselves. Phineas said he would ask God, though later he admitted that he initially examined the book just to make himself acquainted with the heirs. To his surprise, he read and studied. As he read and studied, he was persuaded of the book's truth. For more than a year, he preached from the book to Methodist congregations until he decided that he could not merge the Book of Mormon and Methodism. He had to choose. He determined he must cleave, leave one and cleave to the other. The, his relationship and reliance on the Book of Mormon had developed to the point where he chose the book over Methodism. Now, Phineas's brother and future prophet Brigham had a negative reaction the first time he heard a believer preaching that everybody must believe in the Book of Mormon or be lost. And I think in other places he actually says that you will be damned to hell if you don't accept the Book of Mormon. Not exactly a prime um, useful missionary spiel. Um, Brigham's sisters Rhoda and Fanny had first believed in the book. Fim Phineas had begun to preach from it, but Brigham needed to know from him for himself. As he later described it, he decided to wait a little while and apply his heart to the teachings. After two years of examining the matter studiously, he made up his mind to receive the Book of Mormon. He later testified, I knew it was true as well as I knew that I could see with my eyes or feel by the touch of my fingers. Receiving his own witness enabled Brigham to develop a relationship with the Book of Mormon that would continue to grow. Now, just as these members of the Young family, since 1830, there have been those who received a personal witness of the Book of Mormon through the Spirit very quickly, and there have been those who struggled for years to receive their own conviction. The Lord speaks to each of us in our own unique way of learning spiritually. I personally feel the Spirit in a variety of ways. Um, sometimes the Spirit makes me hyper. Sometimes it makes me confident. Other times it provides an overwhelming peace. 
Um, sometimes my experience aligns with Joseph's description here. This, this always gave me comfort that it was okay that I wasn't feeling a burning in my bosom because I got this. Um, a person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing unto you. It may give you sudden strokes of ideas that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. Um, I am a big fan of pure intelligence flowing unto me. Um, as I taught in religious education at BYU-Idaho and talked with my students about revelation, I would ask them to think about how they received revelation. Over a couple of years, I, took, I kept track of students' responses. Um, and these are their responses mapped out into a word cloud. Um, this is a, a number of different classes. But of course, we have some commonalities, general ideas that work for another a number of people, like peace and an absence of anxiety. Um, but we have lots and lots of other unique responses, such as feeling like warm PJs just came out of the dryer, or feeling a kick in the shins that are very unique. Um, Joseph speaks about, uh, in his letter from Liberty Jail, Joseph wrote of the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost. I think he reworked Pauline language here to describe this phenomenon because feeling the spirit is not something that we can adequately describe. Mortal words are always limited when employed to describe something ineffable. I may be able to look at you and know you're feeling the spirit, but I can't know what you're feeling specifically. Um, let's, let's return to Oliver Cowdery. The admonition to study it out in your mind was not the first revelatory message for Oliver. The Lord had already directed him repeatedly to ask God that he should desire to hear God's voice, be good, not doubt or fear, and look to God. Yet in between those admonitions, the Lord gave a more broadly applicable revelatory direction in section 8. I will speak unto you in your mind and in your heart. Though we have many female examples to the contrary, in the 19th century, intellectual endeavors could be generally thought of as the purview of men. And beyond the influ influence of romanticism, women were often considered more based in emotion. And that was not a good thing. <laughs> For some, the mind represented a male way of knowing and the heart a female way of knowing, one that was often dismissed as too merc mercurial or too flighty. However, Joseph's revelation highlights the importance of both ways of knowing. One isn't privileged at the expense of the other. The Lord will speak to us both emotionally and intellectually. Then the Lord offered a distinct model the Lord called the spirit of revelation. This is the spirit of revelation, the spirit by which Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground. Um, here, this is a Chagall painting, which I love, and you may think is crazy. Um, we can see sometimes Moses has horns. Um, this is from a mistranslation from the Latin Vulgate, but talking about rays of light, this is a, becomes a symbol of revelation coming from his head. I think most often um, we think of this as something miraculous. Um, However, the Lord said this is the perfect example of revelation. Um, Elder Hollins cast not away, therefore, your confidence devotional um, that he gave at BYU a number of years ago. I was sitting here in the Marriott Center as I heard him give that talk. And it is one of those talks that has continued to speak to me over years as I think about why the Lord would say this is the spirit of revelation. Um, I thought about um, using a clip from the Prince of Egypt um, because I'm a fan of when Moses, you have the Egyptians, you have some fire that kind of surrounds the Egyptians and takes care of them for a minute. And Moses and the children of Israel are at the Red Sea. Moses sees the Egyptians coming from behind and isn't quite sure what to do and he tentatively takes a couple steps into the water. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes we have to move forward, even when we're not sure yet. And I like the tentative nature of Moses in that moment. This is not Moses who knows exactly what's going on. This is Moses who is desperately trying to figure it out. Um, God wants to communicate with us. Sometimes we need to move forward, get our feet a little wet, before we know clearly what to do. Now, before I went to divinity school, I was a master's student in history here at BYU. I had applied to my program with a topic for my thesis, but as time moved along, I cared less and less about it. And that's not good when you're about to start a master's thesis. Um, but then one day I sat in class and apart from the topic of that day, I had an epiphany. It became very clear to me that it wasn't just that I was bored with this topic, but the Lord had something else in mind for me. Unfortunately, the epiphany did not come with anything more than a vague idea of a replacement topic. Um, the following week was the Mormon History Association Conference and a helpful professor decided that she would help me find a new thesis topic. Throughout the conference, she introduced me to experienced historians whose work I respected. She would tell them about my old topic, that I wanted a new topic, and ask their advice. With only one exception, everyone to whom she introduced me told me that I should stick with my own old topic, that it was important work that needed to be done. In fact, the most prominent non-Mormon Mormon historian at the time offered me her research as a jumping off point. They were all so kind and convincing that I began to reconsider my revelation. Maybe I didn't understand what the Lord was telling me. Maybe it was just indigestion. Surely I should stick with what I had. The following Monday I was preparing to teach a Doctrine and Covenants class on campus. And as I began to review section 46, um, this is a portrait of a devil, which I love. Um, it does apply here. But as I began to review section 46, I couldn't get past verse 7. I was clearly scolded. You are commanded in all things to ask of God, who giveth liberally, and that which the Spirit testifies unto you, even so I would that you should do in all holiness of heart, walking uprightly before me, considering the end of your salvation, doing all things with prayer and thanksgiving, that you may not be seduced by evil spirits or doctrines of devils or the commandments of men, for some are of men and others are of devils. Now, none of these people were devils or evil spirits. They were all well-meaning individuals trying to help a young, needy graduate student but they did not know God's will concerning me. I had already received my own commandment from God, and I knew it. Eventually, I decided that the advice of the one individual who hadn't thought I should stick with my original th topic was significant. He suggested that I work on women's letters. Eventually, my thesis looked at the religious experience of the earliest Latter-day Saint women through their letters. I don't know that it was a thesis of any great prominence, but it was an important experience for me. My life would be less without learning about these women, their lives, their strength, and their belief. Now, I know that sometimes working out our salvation seems a tiring and a daunting process, and sometimes we mess up, but that is part of the process of mortality. In my favorite succinct encapsulation of the plan of salvation, the Lord says, Behold, I am God and have spoken it. These commandments are of me and were given unto my servants in their weakness, after the manner of their language that they might come to understanding. And inasmuch as they erred, it might be made known. And inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. And inasmuch as they sinned, they might be chastened, that they might repent. And inasmuch as they were humble, they might be made strong and blessed from on high and receive knowledge from time to time.
We've talked about the first part. We're all weak and limited. But God will speak to us in a way that we can understand it. But sometimes we will err. We will make mistakes. And sometimes we will sin. Mistakes and sins, and sins are different things, but both play a central role in our mortal experience. When we recognize that we have sinned, we should repent. And it, in a beautiful example of the principle of indirection, that is that some things are only achieved by doing the opposite. If we're humble, we can be guided from heaven, and ultimately, we can become strong. Failing is simply part of the process. And if we're humble, it doesn't preclude our ability to hear God. I believe humility also allows us to reassess when needed. If you're like me, I often try to guess the end from the beginning. Rarely does that actually, actually I can't even think of an example where that actually works. Um, perhaps we assume because something was initially right, we, intermediate, we immediately know all the intermediate narrative. When I first arrived at my apartment in Nashville, I remember thinking, I'm not moving until I have a PhD in hand. I knew I needed a PhD, and there I was, ready. So A plus B equals C, right? Yet a year later, I decided that I would not stay to complete a PhD there, but would complete a Master's of Theology. That decision was more difficult than going in the first place. But again, I felt certain of my course. It was not the final step in my schooling as I had anticipated. Rather, it was a crucial step along the way. At that point, I could not imagine that it would take me another decade before I would complete my PhD. I had a glimpse of where I was headed. I just didn't expect the path it would require. Now, my time at Vanderbilt, this is the chapel at Vanderbilt, and it has this amazing stained glass that I love. But my time there is representative of a consistent theme in my life. My life follows a circuitous path. I mostly believe that circles are way more interesting than straight lines. But some days I still wish my life proceeded in a more straightforward way. Nevertheless, I have been guided all along the way. In the middle of one of those winding paths, Camille Franck commented me, that to me that many of the faithful women she knows lead circuitous lives. Sometimes I'm able to let go of my expectations and frustrations to really see the beauty of my path. And as I look back, I can see value in all the circles. And in quiet moments, I'm overwhelmed by the grace and the guidance I receive along the way. Thank you.